You're listening to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter. That's me, your sassy source for lifestyle advice, wellness tips, and pop culture dish. I'm the reality TV junkie, self-improvement addict, and holistic hustler here to help you get your shit together and laugh through all the chaos of life in your 20s. If you're not doing so already, go and give me a follow at Just Plain Zach for really funny Instagram stories, probably of my neighbors while we're all on lockdown. Um, adorable memes and really cute selfies lately. Lots of really wild TikTok videos. I'm a terrible dancer, but I'm dancing for you while we try to get through this quarantine life. So I'm really excited. So we did a very special throwback reality TV week two weeks ago. And we had on some of the old uh, flavor of love. I love money, uh, rock of love cast members. And so I'm excited to continue that because today's guest is probably one of my favorites from that franchise. I think definitely in the top three, if I had to pick, you may remember her as the feisty redheaded potster on the classic VH1 hits like Rock of Love, Charm School, and the unseen season of I Love Money 3. But we know she still brought the heat, even though we didn't get to see it, which is why I'm going to ask her all about it. Please welcome Miss Lazy Skulls. Hey there. How are you? I am great. How are you? I am fantastic. I love your podcast. And I just want to say thank you so much for having me on. I'm super excited. I'm not used to being on this end of the podcast. So kind of nice. You're new to the podcast world. Talk to me about Talk of Love and um, like explain to people what it is, what made you start it, and what you're doing now. What we're 12 years after Rock of Love? Yes. I have to say, I am just blown away by the level of support and viewers and just people really, really enjoying the podcast. So, how this all started actually about a year ago. My original idea was to have a talk show format that I was going to call Indecent Exposure. And I basically was going to get into like social issues and politics and things that I'm like really passionate about. And um, Indecent Exposure, I was going to expose things within our society that I felt need, Mm -hmm. you know, a spotlight shined upon it. And um, I kind of had this really big grand idea about production and all that. And after a period of time, my husband was like, you know, Lacey, why don't you do a podcast? It's so much easier than doing like a whole big production style talk show. And you can still talk about what you want to talk about. And in a period of time over several months, I started sort of evolving how I wanted to do things because, you know, even though I I actually, people don't know this about me, but I'm a huge news junkie and I actually am quite political, but right now everything is so freaking divisive and that's not my intention to further divide people. And I'm all about, you know, I'm an animal rights activist. I'm all about uniting people for a similar cause. And um, so I was just kind of rehashing this with my husband and right about the same time, um, Heather reached out to me and Heather from Rock of Love, and she was happening, just happened to be thinking about doing a podcast as well. And so she reached out to me and she knows I'm like a very technical person because I grow, grew up in a recording studio. So I knew all like the technical ends of things. She's like, let's do a podcast together. And so um, I was like, you know, it's not a bad idea. Let's, you know, the, there's so much politics and that kind of thing already. So I'm like, yeah, that would be great. And we decided that we're going to do a podcast where we kind of rehab all the old rock of love shows and charm school and all that and then my husband came up with the title talk of love and we were both like oh my god that's brilliant so that's how talk of love started <laughs> so was the intention of talk of love because it seems like the show that came out and the show that you were originally planning the concept was a little different where you guys are now tackling each week like different behind the scenes takes on what happened on all of those shows which as me as a, a viewer that was like uh, consuming all of that reality TV then like I love to watch it and now I'm geeking out listening to all of the behind the scenes um, info was the did you guys kind of come to the agreement that you didn't want to tackle the original concept that you had last year for your own podcast well Heather is really uh, did not want to even go anywhere near politics she was afraid that that people would disagree with her and maybe give her a hard time about her own political beliefs. And it just wasn't, it's not really something that she's passionate about anyway, which is totally okay. It's totally okay. It's just different, you know, ideas of what we're into. And to be honest, you know, I like the idea of doing something really light and I'm like, let's just try it out, see how it goes. And, um, after the first episode, um, I put it up on, on my own personal YouTube channel just to kind of try it out, give it a go. And people just right out the gate really, really liked it and were really enjoying it. And then, um, 
not too long after that, the whole pandemic happened. And yeah. so now people are, I think, going to the podcast for a sense of escapism. And when I am sitting back and realizing how much people are enjoying the podcast and how much it is giving them that escapism. And to be honest, it's giving me escapism too. Yeah. And um, it, it made me go, well, this is what people want right now. This is what people need right now. It makes me feel good that it's making them feel good. So that's, I'm like, that's what I'm going to go with. <laughs> No, I mean, that's one of the reasons like we normally I mean, we have a studio and we tape in studio, but like I'm literally home like with a soundboard and a microphone and trying to figure it all out from my apartment. Um, but like one of the reasons we decided to up the show to three times a week is because we feel like people need that escapism where it isn't that heavy deep dive into the politics of everything. Um, I mean, we do touch on certain things um, here and there, but like for the most part, I wanted to give people a place to kind of just get away from all of the heavy news that's out there and kind of just geek out over the reality TV entertainment pop culture world that we all kind of secretly indulge in from now and again, even though right now we're indulging in it a lot more. Um, but I do love your political stance and, or not political, but just your own personal stance on like, you don't like to look at things as very black and white. I think you're like one of those people that's like, we have to find a gray area where we can find a common ground with whatever the issue is, because the reality is when you put down 10 issues and you know, we maybe disagree on eight or nine of them there's like that one or two that we probably disagree or we agree on eight or nine of them and we don't agree on those one or two and those are the ones that we fight about and not realize that like we're so much more alike than we are different you are so right you worded that perfectly and you know i'm i'm 43 years old now and it took years and years of me having to learn and evolve and honestly i learned so much by being an animal rights activist and there's so many different groups out there that do things in a totally different way like for instance you know PETA is quite extreme in the way they deal with things and then on the opposite end of the spectrum there's greenpeace that has a, a much more passive approach of dealing with things and i think that both are right and you you kind of need both and so i've been kind of watching how everybody does things and pulling from all of it and um and kind of creating my own way of tackling these issues and you know when i was in my 20s and and i'd say the beginning of my 30s i was very much like no no tolerance for this and no tolerance for that and if you believe in this and you're wrong and what i learned from that is all that does is make it so the people that maybe you could have recruited or the people that you could have changed your mind are just repelled by that energy and all you end up doing is shouting to your own people you end up mm -hmm. preaching to the choir preaching well i don't want to preach to the choir I already, I already got the choir you know i want to get the people who um have different political beliefs than I do. And what's surprising to me is I very, very much do have fans on both sides of the political spe spectrum. And I remember when I first started realizing that and becoming aware of it, I was really surprised because I thought that one group would like me and the other group would not. But I've been able to pull from both groups. And so I'm like, you know what? This is a responsibility now on me to keep everybody listening, to keep everybody focused. And I'm not going to like throw the hammer down on one group or one type of ideology rather i'm gonna just you know slowly gently let them know these are things that are important to me these are things i feel that we as a society can grow and change and hopefully they'll stay with me and see my point of view and I feel like that's the way you get more people to understand you, maybe not necessarily agree with you, but you get more people to understand you. And I think even when you have conversations or listen to any opposing viewpoints, you even understand yourself and your own argument, whether you agree with them or not, so much better because you get to really explore both sides of the equation and really ask yourself, well, what do I believe? What do I agree with? And what part of this issue really resonates with me as a person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. It, it takes a lot of really serious, introspective way of thinking. And that's something that I've mm -hmm. learned as well. I'll tell you something. Um, <laughs> here's one really big learning um, scenario for me. When I was living in Los Angeles, I just, my husband and I just moved to Vegas last year. But when I was in Los Angeles, a lot of people know that I ran my own dog rescue organization for eight years. Mm -hmm. And What's funny about that is that we as a society are, are taught and trained to not judge people or at least not judge them so quickly. But the whole thing about dog rescues, I'm getting these dogs out of the animal shelter or dogs that are strays or dogs that are at risk of being euthanized. 
and I foster them and then I have to rehome them. And in rehoming these dogs, I literally have to judge people and I have to judge strangers. Yeah. And it was, it was really eye opening to me. It actually showed me where my own personal biases are because I, you know, my, my, I'm a big believer in equality, whether it's race, gender, LGBTQ, religion, nationality, I am, I'm all about equality. But when I was adopting the dogs out, um, you know, I would, I would get emails from people and we'd go back and forth and I'd send them an application. And I started going like, well, I think this type of person will make a good home and this type of person will not make a good home. And I started trying to analyze myself on how am I coming to these conclusions? Am I being fair? Cause that was, that's my big thing is fairness. I, I will be a bitch and I'll be an asshole, but it has to be justified is how I look at it. So I, I started looking at the applications that I was, I was not inclined to adopt to these people. And I realized to my own horror that I was being biased against people who had unusual names and um, na not, not westernized names. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh my God, am I racist? Oh no. And I started like really going like, I got to figure this out. Why am I being biased about this? And you know, when I was in college, my best friend who lived in my dorm with me, her name was Minu Bardwaj and she, her family was from India. And I loved Minu and you know, she had an unusual name, but I would adopt a dog to her in a heartbeat because she's an awesome person. So I started really looking, looking at it. I'm like, what is it that I'm judging about these people? And what I realized it had nothing to do with their name or the spelling of their name or anything like that. It had to do with how were they writing sentences? Did they come across as educated or not? That's what my bias was. It wasn't their name. It wasn't where they came from. It was, do, they, do I perceive them as being educated or not? But even at that, maybe they are educated and English is their second language. I can't judge them on that. That has nothing to do with yeah. their intellect or their ability to take care of a dog. So my point is, it was a lot of learning and I, it was a great growth period for me. But the only way I was able to do that is by looking inward and going, why am I doing this? Why am I behaving this way? Why am I thinking these thoughts? And it was a, a big growth for me. Absolutely. I think you have to look inward and too many people are afraid to do that. But that's kind of one thing that I've learned to appreciate, you know, as, as I say that with my teeth clenched together very tightly with this quarantine experience is you are forced to kind of be with yourself and look inward and kind of like I'm learning all new parts of myself. And I'm like, I don't know if I like all these parts, but now I feel like I'm coming out of it a lot more. Um, I joke that I'm very emotionally unavailable, but now I'm coming out of this a lot more emotionally available and just physically unavailable um, for the foreseeable future. But so having talk of love, has that now been cathartic for you being that there I'm sure were so many years where people had all these questions about the shows and they've watched reruns and they, you know, want to know what that behind the scenes life like was for you. Is it nice to kind of like be able to let it all out and interview some of your old cast members? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. And it's nice to kind of let my guard down and let people see the real me, so to speak. You know, when I was on these shows, I was very, very guarded. I had this character that I had created, uh, which was a lot of fun. I loved being the villain. Um, and, um, but it was not an environment conducive to being vulnerable. And I think that's where a lot of the girls had a hard time is they, they did, you know, show their vulnerabilities. They did show their soft side, their emotional side. And a lot of them had really serious issues after the show was over. It was really quite um, traumatic for them. On a, they felt taken advantage of by the show. They took, you know, yeah. felt taken advantage of by the producers. And some even felt taken advantage of by Brett. And for me, because I was this character and I was very guarded, um, it made it so that it was a fun experience for me, not a um, traumatic experience. I didn't feel exploited like some of the other girls did. But what's cool about the podcast is um, I do kind of get to show people like who I really am. I mean, definitely that villain character. I have that in me for sure. I'm not going to sit there and go yeah. like, no, I'm not that person. <laughs> of course. We all do. You know? I'm a little pot stir myself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, you know, the other thing that's cool about the podcast is um, I, I sort of told myself that that now I am going to raise the bar for myself and be vulnerable to the viewers. And that is a thing that is hard for me to be vulnerable. It's very scary. Um, I've kind of 
talked about some issues that have happened in my own personal life. You know, one thing I've talked about uh, a couple of times, I brought up my mom. I lost her to suicide um, a little over a decade ago, but still feels like a very raw, fresh wound. Um, and I never wanted to talk about that publicly. And in fact, the idea of even starting to talk about it would like send me into a panic attack. And I just, you know, it, it's scary for me. But now I, I love the viewers and I feel like the viewers have been so good to me and they have, um, you know, I, I trust them. I trust them. And so I'm like, I was talking to my husband about this and, and, you know, he was telling me, you know, Lacey, I, I know it's, it's a scary thing for you to be vulnerable and show this other side to you, but you have to think about the fact that when you're ready by talking about this stuff, um, it might help some of your fans. What if some of your, what if some of the viewers have been through similar experiences? And from that perspective, I was like, you know what? He's totally right. And, um, I'm just going to have to take a leap of faith. <laughs> so it's been a good growing experience for me. And I love the vulnerability that we get to see because when we saw you on each of those shows, it felt very much like um, you were the villain and you were stirring drama. But now we see that you were coming into this. You said that you, one of the people you looked up to on reality TV was New York and you loved the character that she played on Flavor of Love. Um, so before we dive into like the whole Rock of Love, and I want to ask like about the other seasons of Rock of Love and Charm School, and of course, I love money because we didn't get to see it and I still want to see it. Um, I do want to ask about Heather because Heather did start the podcast with you and you guys kind of were co-hosts in it together. And then there was a bit of a, a falling out that I did naturally want to ask you about to see what your response to any of the stuff that she's put out on social media is and to see kind of where you guys stand and if there's been any mending. You know, the Heather situation was really, really upsetting and is still very upsetting. Um, you know, when Heather came back into my life, I was really excited and I really liked how she and I, you know, our banter back and forth and our rapport with one another, our chemistry. And I think that she is a very good person Deep down, she's a good girl. She unfortunately has a lot of demons. And, you know, I heard the interview that you did with 12 Pack, which I thought was a great interview. Love 12 Pack. And he really hit the nail on the head with a lot of things that he said about her. You know, he mentioned that she was very obsessive. She is very vindictive. And um, I'm like, yeah, he, he totally nailed it. And so what ended up happening pretty much right out the gate, Heather was using the Talk of Love podcast to essentially air her grievances and any of the castmates from the past or even Brett Michaels himself that she felt wronged her from her perspective. She was using the podcast to bash them and shame them. And so immediately I was like, girl, no, like this is not what the podcast is for. I mean, first of all, I like all these people that Heather's bashing, Megan, Farah, Ashley, Brett, all these people, 12 pack. I like these people, you know, and so I told her, and I was like, and that's just, it's such a negative energy, you know, like, let's not use the podcast for this. Yeah. And she would just get so angry and we would fight and fight and it just got really brutal. She accused me of taking their side over her side. I'm like, there is no side. This is all stuff that happened yeah. 12 years ago, you know? So, um, you know, the thing about Heather that really is a shame and makes it difficult to try to work through things with her when 12 pack mentioned the vindictiveness. Heather has a three-pronged approach of dealing with problems. First, she gathers all of the personal information about you, any kind of personal problems or, or anything in your personal yeah. life. She uses that and she weaponizes it. Then she, if your dirty laundry is not like dirty enough to air, she'll make up just blatant lies about you. She'll just lie about you. And then her third part of approach to dealing with it is then she will use all of that to publicly shame you. And um, it's just such an unhealthy and toxic way to deal with problems. You know, like, girl, just talk to the person or, or ignore them. You know, why does it have to be this like giant public spectacle of shaming, you know? And um, with the thing with, uh, you know, case in point with Megan, the big thing was she was going and saying like, oh, Megan had sex with this person, had sex with that person to get her own yeah. show, which surely wasn't true. But there she was slut shaming. And again, public humiliation with 12 packs. She was like, oh, he, his body isn't really like that. He's an imposter. He throws up his food, blah, blah, blah. So body yeah. shaming. And she tried to do that on the podcast too. And I had to stop her. That led to a big fight. It's, and again, not true. With me, she, uh, she made a bunch of posts online about my husband's 
dad um, helping me out with finances. My dog had just had a really major surgery that cost almost $2,000. I didn't have the money. He helped me out with that. She put me on blast for that, dragged my dad's father into it. I'm like, girl, why, if you have a problem with me, why are you, you publicly airing my finances? Like, really? Yeah. And so it's just, it's, it's really sad. And the problem is also that she, her other go-to is playing the victim. And she always, it's, it's always everybody else's fault. It's never Heather. But if you think about all the people she's had issues with, Heather hates 12 pack, Heather hates Megan, Heather hates Brett, Heather hates Lacey. Who is the common denominator in all of this? Yeah. It's Heather, you know? And um, so the other thing I've noticed too, is a lot of the people she tends to have serious problems with me, Megan, 12 pack, you know, Brandy C, we're all married. And personally, no shame on anybody, whether they're married, whether they're divorced, whether they're single, I don't care. It's no one's business. Yeah. But she doesn't like that. She feels that they have one up on her if they're married, if they're doing well in life. And to be honest, this all really started um, getting out of control when she, you know, she spent the last few months with me. So I really know her quite well. And she was having like major problems with her real estate career. And she wasn't able to sell houses like she wanted to. And uh, she was really, really stressed. And so when she gets stressed, instead of focusing on that, what she does is she starts obsessing on everybody else. And that's where she puts her stress. She's like, what, what is Megan doing? I have to expose Megan. What about 12 pack? I got to expose him. What about Lacey? I got to expose her. It, it's always like exposing is kind of her thing. Yeah. But what I think that is, is that she herself is afraid of being exposed. So she has to put the attention on everybody else so they don't look at her. And the sad part about that is she spends so much of her time and energy um, trying to make everybody else miserable because she herself is miserable. And it took a lot of time for me to figure all this out. And at the end of the day, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's really sad. I'm sad for Heather. I'm sad. She's in this place. You know, she, she has turned into a hater and that's not the Heather I know. And, um, anyway, it's just, it's really, really, really heartbreaking. I've shed many of tears over the situation. Um, but I also want people to know who are fans of rock of love when you hear Heather spouting these things about me or about 12 pack or, or Megan or Brett or whatever, just take it with a grain of salt because Heather is hurting. Yeah. Heather is in pain. This is her go-to and we just have to give her um, as much compassion as we can. That's really the bottom line. Well, it's like what we were talking about earlier about self-reflection and like sometimes you need to look inward and you also have to realize that when you have an issue with other people, sometimes it's because they're the mirror that showing us the parts of us that we don't really want to see. Um, and we've tried to, because Heather has reached out to the show and she was very upset with uh, Dave's interview. And I've talked to Dave since and, um, you know, I just, I want to thank you and thank Dave for both kind of coming on the show and like indulging us on all this reality TV tea. But also, you know, I don't feel like either of you necessarily wanted to have an issue with her or, or bashing her in any way. I think there's a lot of love that's going her way. And, you know, I think whatever healing or um, peace she's seeking for, hopefully she can, you know, find that and, you know, be able to find some happiness within her life. Hopefully she's doing a lot of meditation right now in quarantine. Um, but I, I, agree. I, I do want to chat about rock of love and, uh, charm school. I have a lot of questions actually from charm school. I know you guys have tackled a lot of rock of love on the show. Um, what do you still have a relationship with Brett currently? Uh, you know, I, I don't actively, but, uh, anytime he comes to town, I always go and meet up with him and say hi. And, um, in fact about, uh, God, how long ago was this? Maybe eight months ago or so. Whenever, uh, Brett and his band were last in Las Vegas, uh, we reached out to them and they got us backstage, me and my husband and my husband loves Brett, loves the band. And so we went backstage and met up with Brett. So it was my husband's first time to, to meet Brett and immediately start like comparing notes. Like, so how do you handle Lacey? And this oh, and no. I, I'm like, hang on a second. <laughs> I don't know. I like this anymore. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, Brett was just so sweet to my husband. My husband was just like thrilled by the whole thing. And then um, Pete Evick is another one who I just love, who's Brett's uh, guitar player. And Pete is a big Star Wars fan as is my husband. So they were both like nerding out in Star Wars stuff. And so, um, I, I love Brett, you know, to be honest, I've always been a fan of him from a musician standpoint, but I'm also a fan of him personally. 
And, um, you know, I'm really grateful for the show because no one would know who the fuck I am if it wasn't for Brett Michaels and the show, you know? And so now yeah. I get to have a platform where I can talk about different issues and stuff. So I, I'm really grateful for, for him and all of it. Do you think that overall the show helped or hurt your career or your career opportunities once it ended? Because I feel like some of the castmates are on either side of the playing field. Uh, I definitely feel like it helped me from the perspective of it opened a lot of doors for me. I had a lot of really cool opportunities. Uh, for example, um, after, uh, let's see, how long? About one year after... I love money. Um, two years after term school, I got invited to tour the country with one of my favorite bands, Lords of Acid. I got to be their front woman and singer for uh, a, a U.S. tour in 2010. That was awesome. Um, I also got invited to uh, speak at a, a press conference at the state capitol in California alongside Senator Dean Flores in favor of animal-friendly legislation. That was really, really cool. I don't think I would have had that opportunity had it not been for my appearance on Rock of Love. Um, I think that it helped, uh, you know, to get people paying attention to my dog rescue organization. I mean, I think there was a lot of good that came from that and opportunities. So yeah, I definitely um, would say that things were positive for me after the show because of the show. So there was a lot of heat with the last season of Rock of Love, which was the Rock of Love bus. Were you a fan of that season as one of like the OGs? Did you think it was their best season? And would you have done the bus version? It was amazing. Um, absolutely. You know, my favorite was Ashley and Farrah. I love those yeah. girls so freaking much. And, and in particular, Ash, or sorry, in particular, Farrah has been a good friend of mine for probably about 10 years. And I love Farrah, but her and Ashley are just hilarious together. They are so funny. And um, I mean, yeah, I would do any of these shows, you know, I mean, I'm obviously not now because I'm married, but um, I, I love the shows. I was obsessed with all of these shows before I was even ever invited to be on Rock of Love. I was obsessed with, you know, Flavor of Love. I love New York, Surreal Life. I watched all of those shows. I watched, you know, all of them after me as well. I thought the girls did a really great job on uh, Rock of Love Bus. I thought they were super, super entertaining. And I can tell that like every season that passes, the girls are, I feel like they're trying to like outdo the wildness of the season before, you know? So I, I feel like if there was like a Rock of Love, like season eight or 10 or something, they'd be like jumping out of helicopters topless or something, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> that would but be funny. Uh, it was really fun. I, I love that season. I, I think girls did a great job on, on season three. So one of the questions that people keep asking me, but I can't answer this question, is um, will 12 Pack be on Talk of Love? Will you be interviewing him anytime soon? Have you talked to him at all? Yes, I have been going back and forth with 12 Pack. I really like that guy. I think he's great. I think he um, handles himself really well. Um, He's very uh, intelligent and, and very kind and, and he works hard. He's just a really good dude. And uh, so I'm actually working on a little project with him right now, which I'm, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about yet. So I guess I won't um, to be safe. But, um, but in addition to that, yes, he is going to come on the, um, the podcast. I've got so many people lined up right now. I wish I could just like do it all at one time. <laughs> yeah. But yes, um, probably in the next few weeks or maybe next month, I'm definitely going to have him on. I like him a lot. He's a good guy. Okay, and I think he's going to have a lot of good tea to spill. Oh, yeah, I'm sure he will. And he uh, has aged very well. I mean, as of you. But I was like, wow, oh. 12 pack. I would I would jump on that in two seconds if you didn't have a wife. <laughs> <laughs> Quarantine has made me yes. very lonely. Um, oh. <laughs> Daisy De La Hoya. Did you ever have a relationship with her or work with her? I know she was on season two. So you guys didn't work together on camera. But were there any was there any relationship with you guys? Um, not really. I, I interviewed her. Um, way back in the day, I was the, uh, there's a music convention that happens every year in California called NAM. And, um, it's a really big music convention. And, uh, I was the live, um, host for Dean Guitar's webcast live from NAM. I did that a couple of years in a row where basically I would just hang out at their booth and anytime somebody would walk by, I'd like run over and interview them. And because Daisy played bass for one of her bands a while ago, I, I did an interview with her that's up online somewhere, which is pretty funny. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of her only because, um, you know, when I was living in LA, I used to see her at the rainbow and I'd see her here and there. And she, she just always was kind of like 
stuck up towards me and standoffish. And I, I really don't like that uh, quality in people who are stuck up. Now, um, to be fair, because I like to be fair, I could be misperceiving that. Maybe she has insecurities. Maybe she was shy. Maybe she just wasn't in the mood to talk to me that day. I don't know. But I've, I've run to her like five or six times and she just was always super stuck up. And I just don't understand um, her energy. And there's like some things that she personally believes in that I'm not really vibing with either. And actually destiny and I have a conversation about that, which is going to um, be on uh, talk of love on Monday. We, we kind of get into that a little bit, but, um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm not a huge fan, but um, you know, I'm sure if I saw her out, it'd be cool. You know, talk to me about charm school. So, or why I, I, my biggest question about charm school is with the reunion. So at the reunion, there was a very notable, um, little fight that, or maybe not so little, but there was a tiff between Megan and Sharon Osborne. And so we heard about a lot. We, uh, we heard a lot about it in the press, but when we saw it, there was a big chunk of that footage that was missing. Can you talk to me or can you let me know what happened while you guys were taping that? What, like what happened between Megan and and Sharon exactly? <laughs> You're going to hate my answer so much. So I thought a lot about this because everybody asks, and here's my perspective on that. Um, Sharon and who I'm a big fan of Sharon. Um, Sharon went to great lengths to make sure that certain things were censored. I think that mm -hmm. things were said about her husband that were very hurtful. I think, um, actions were taken that were hurtful to both Sharon and Megan also. I'm a big Megan fan too. Um, so I think things happened that um, both of them really made efforts to censor for their own personal reasons. And because I like both of those women, I don't really feel like it's my place to air their dirty laundry as I was just criticizing somebody else earlier for doing. Yeah. Um, it, it's just not my place. And I think that if Sharon wants to put that out there or if Megan wants to put that out there, they would be the, the people to put that out there. But because it was such a devastating thing that took place, um, I just don't feel like it's it's not my place to to talk about it. And I'm so sorry. I know you guys hate that. That's fair. That no, that's fair. I mean, I mean we, we're talking to Megan and she's um, expressed interest in coming on the show. She's a little under the weather at the moment, but I would I. Her, I think you, Megan, and Brandy C were my three favorites. So that would be like Aww. my dream team to get on this show from Rock of Love. So hopefully scheduling works out and we get Megan on because um, I have a, a ton of questions for her too. She's amazing. I love her. You know, well, that's the other thing too is, is maybe she feels differently since I interviewed her for Talk of Love. But I did specifically ask her beforehand. I asked everybody before, like, what do you want to talk about? What don't you want to talk about? So I know to avoid that. And um, so I, I did ask Megan, do you want to get into that? And at the time she was like, eh, you know, not really. And I was like, all right, that's cool. But she may have changed her mind since then. So, you know, it's worth asking. But I mean, essentially just things were said. They got heated. And then it turned physical and that's, you know, in a nutshell what happened. <laughs> Well, I mean, they definitely know how to make good TV. I'll tell you that. So I heard a rumor that there is a I Love Money reunion in the works with the season three cast. And you guys might be doing something where you spill all the details about what actually happened in that season since we will likely never see it. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. So um, a lot of people don't know this, but Chelsea, a.k.a. Lil Hood, when she was on um, Ray J., she was actually my roommate for a while and we oh. lived together. Yeah, she's awesome. I love her. She's such a sweet, wonderful, amazing person. And um, she has been reaching out to me about doing this with her. And uh, I actually have been kind of uh, flaky, but only just because I've been super busy with the Talk of Love podcast. I should actually thank you for the reminder. I should give her a call after this. Um, <laughs> I actually do want to be involved in that. And I did invite all of them onto the Talk of Love podcast so that we can get into the details. Cause the thing is you guys have to remember that, um, I love money three happened in 2009 or 10, nine. Yeah. 2009. So, I mean, that was 11 years ago and yeah. because it never aired, we didn't get to watch it back. So it's, it's a lot of the memories are kind of like not super clear. I, I'm like, I do remember a lot of it, but there are some little moments where I'm like, oh, wait, I can't, what happened there? And why, you know, it's hard for me to remember exactly every little thing. So it will yeah. be good to like unite with the old castmates because then we can kind of jog each other's memories, you know, because it was it was so great. I'm, I'm so bummed. Everybody's bummed that show didn't air because it was 
fantastic. It was so fun and wild and crazy and just over the top, but entertaining too. So um, yeah, it's a shame that things went down the way they did. So you've opened up a little bit about the whole Ryan Jenkins, uh, Jasmine scandal and how that affected I Love Money 3 and why, you know, since he did win that season, that's what ended up not um, preventing that season from airing. What you talked about having an alliance with him on I Love Money and kind of even still being in contact with him after the show had aired. What was your reaction and what were you feeling and like going through mentally as the news was breaking and then you found out that he actually did commit the murder and then committed suicide being that you were so close to or knew him so closely I would say the overall feeling was shock um it was such an insane week um to be honest I didn't personally like Ryan he's not the kind of person that I like I mean I mentioned Daisy being stuck up earlier um Ryan was really really arrogant I hate arrogant people it makes me crazy. Um, and my immediate like desire is to like shoot them down and take them down a few pegs, you know? Yeah. So, um, I didn't like him and, and he was like very like nouveau riche, you know, with like the, he had like Gucci flip flops and it just kind of like borderline, that borderline. Guy. Gucci, yeah. Kind of that guy. So, um, you know, I, the reason I formed an alliance with him is, uh, I mean, you guys know this about me by now. I'm fiercely competitive and like I am I allowed to curse on here yeah yeah, yeah. okay so like I don't give a fuck if it's a competition and you know my whole big catchphrase on on uh rock of love was like I'm just gonna knock them all out one by one till they're all gone that's how I play the game whether it's you know rock of love charm school I love money if I'm putting like a competition setting that's kind of like what I turn into and with Ryan he was a beast master with these challenges. I mean, he was determined to win the whole damn show. Determination like I've never seen in a human being before that he put his mind to it and that man accomplished it. And he was winning every single challenge. And I was like, I have to align with this guy um, in order to keep myself here as long as possible. And um, what ended up happening was he started confiding in me. He confided in me and I believe cocktail was the other person. I wasn't super close with cocktail. Not, not for any particular reason. I actually like cocktail. It just, I was trying to get her on board, you know, um, later in the game, I started to, I decided that Ryan was going to win the whole damn show, which he did. So I was going to do, um, I, I had an idea of like forming a girls Alliance and, and getting Ryan out. But cocktail and cashmere who are friends with each other i think they just didn't trust me and i don't blame them for that and so i was trying to get them in on my alliance and i just i couldn't so um i i was kind of like distance distance myself from them only for that reason they're lovely women but um but anyway so ryan was uh confiding in me about jasmine his wife and you know i just kind of like listened to him like go on and on about her and um in doing so he I guess he felt a connection to me on that level because I listened to him, you know, go on about her. So after the um, after the show was over, we exchanged numbers. I mean, we all exchange numbers. That's kind of what happens. Everybody exchanges numbers with everybody. And I had mentioned to him that I ride, I ride horses. And so he, after the show had finished taping, we were all back in the U.S., he had been reaching out to me because uh, he wanted me to take his wife horseback riding with me. And I was mm-hmm. like, okay, sure, you know. I I was a little surprised he was like actually following up on some kind of friendship, but I think he was just doing anything he could to appease Jasmine, who apparently was really hard to appease. So, um, so then there was, there was like a little bit of gap. I got really busy. I came back to him one day via text and I was like, Hey, you know, are you still wanting me to take Jasmine riding with me? I'm free this weekend. When are you guys, when are you guys free? And, um, and then he wrote me, he texted me back and he's like, Oh, she's actually busy right now. Rain check. And I was like, sure. I found out after the fact that when he sent me that last text message, he had already killed her. Mm. Uh, it was like, Holy shit. And, um, then shortly after that, I was being reached, uh, I VH one or actually specifically, sorry, 51 minds, a production company reached out to me and they're like, Hey, Lacey, just so you know, if like any press, reaches out to you and wants to know about Ryan, just ignore them. And at that point I didn't know Ryan had done this. Um, so they're like, just ignore whatever press reaches out to you and asks you about Ryan. I'm like, 
why? <laughs> and they're like, yeah. oh, we can't tell you. I'm like, you can't just tell me, don't talk to press about Ryan and then not tell me why. And they're like, well, yeah. okay, there's rumors that he might've murdered his wife, but you know, we don't really think he did it. I was like, what? You know, it was just shocking. And then I started seeing it all over like Yahoo News and just everywhere. And I tried calling him, I got his voicemail. By then he was already, you know, making a run for it to Canada. It was just like every day of that week was some new revelation of some craziness. And it was really really shocking, really devastating. I didn't like the guy, but I didn't wish ill will upon him. Then when he committed suicide, I had dealt with suicide in my life before. So that was kind of triggering. And, and as I said, like, just cause I like somebody, I, I don't wish them death or, or any right. kind of, this. Oh, it was, I mean, you can see me getting worked up right now. It was yeah. like, unbelievable, unfucking believable. Did you foresee it affecting that whole reality TV world the way that it did? Did you at any, was that even, a, a um, did it even cross your mind that like this could affect I Love Money 3 and could potentially affect other future shows? Yeah, I did. Um, I, it was just turning into such insanity. Um, I just had a feeling that this was going to be it. I mean, he won, yeah. I love money three. He won the whole yeah. damn show. Then they pulled Megan's show because he was on it. And I was just like, this is not going to end well. And what sucks is, I mean, that situation obviously was devastating for both Ryan and Jasmine, but a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people yeah. lost their career. I mean, people don't understand how many people work on the set of these shows. A lot of people lost their jobs and careers. And, um, it was devastating for, for us, um, the, the people who were on the show. Um, and it was devastating for fans, you know, cause this was this whole like of love thing has been going on for, um, for many, many years and it built this huge yeah. fan base. And that was just like halted, you know, and it now, was such and a well oiled machine at that point that I could imagine that like nobody expected it to just come to the abrupt halt that it did that like nobody, like people thought that they had, you know, a job for the next few years and they could leave when they wanted to leave and everything just came to such a halting end. Yeah, 100%. 100%. It was so devastating on so many levels. Um, it's crazy that like two people, two volatile people can have this like, you know, this impact that just expands outward so wide. Um, two people's shitty actions, you know, can just affect yeah. so many lives. Um, it's, it's heartbreaking. It really, really was a horrible and traumatizing situation. It was awful. Did you ever see any of that footage from no. I Love Money 3? No, I think that what I heard was that they were starting to edit it together. Um, generally it takes several months for them to edit these shows. I mean, it's, it's multiple camera angles, 24 hours a day of footage. I mean, that is a ton of footage that, that I go through. So my understanding is that they were in the process of editing. It was ended before they even fully edited it. So when people are like, oh, just put it out, put it out. There is nothing to put out. And that's what people don't yeah. understand. There, there is nothing. All raw to footage. It's all raw footage. Like, and if they just put out raw footage, you'd be, I mean, it's, it'd be like, footage of people laying out by the pool for six hours. You know, it's like, it, yeah. it has to be edited together for it to make sense. And it just, that just didn't happen. Ah, well, I hope that this reunion does happen. Cause I would love to see it kind of come to fruition and see what the cast would have, what the dynamic would have been like. Um, are you still in touch with a lot of the, I love money or charm school girls? Um, you or know, I class? wasn't, um, sorry, I'm going to change positions here. <laughs> I wasn't, but, um, but because of the Talk of Love podcast, I, I got back in touch with a lot of the girls or also, um, you know, Big John. And um, it's been really cool. It's been really, really cool. In fact, one person who'll be coming on Talk of Love pretty soon that I didn't realize how much I liked her until recently, and she's fucking awesome, is Sam from season one. Sam is, is really fucking cool. We, we've been spending a lot of time catching up. Um, she's really great. But um, back to I Love Money 3, um, that was a fun show too, because it was, um, the cast was made up of, of both genders, you know, guys and girls. I would yeah. say I liked the most people in that moment on that show more so than any of the other shows. Um, I've, I formed a lot of really close, uh, friendships 
delicious and um shay who was you know bucky on flavor bucky, blog yeah those two women i was the closest with and i loved them they were my favorite they were such awesome fun funny women um and then also my arch nemesis on i love money three like my my dallas if you will was um was uh paul who was um oh what was his name on on daisy show um Weasel. Weasel. Yeah. Weasel. Yes. He is hysterical. And what was so great about him was, you know, we were just like going at it with each other because in order to be a villain, I have to have people I can villainize over <laughs> after, you know? Yeah, of course. So, so I, I, I can't remember what happened that I, I chose him, but we were just really going at it. And then there was a couple of times where the cameraman wasn't there and I'd look at him. I'm like, Hey, Weasel. I'm like, you know, I'm just fucking with you, right? And he's like, oh, I know, don't worry about it. And we kind of like do the fist bump, you know? And then the cameras would come running back, like, what are you guys talking about? And I'd be like, I'm just telling him what a piece of shit he is. And he always called me Fire Crotch. That was his, his nickname for me, which was amazing. And, um, but it was, he was like one of the only people who actually got it that we're like making a show or making entertainment. Yeah. And he battled me so well, it was hysterical. And I just, I really, really like him a lot. He was so much fun. And um, I still talk to him quite a bit. So there, there's a few I talk to. As I said, um, Chelsea, a.k.a. Lil Hood, is awesome. Love that girl. So I, I definitely liked that cast the most out of all the shows. Will you ever have Dallas on Talk of Love? I would. Yes, I absolutely would. There's a couple of girls that I'm going to reach out to that I haven't yet that I um, – I feel like I have to do like a whole big pitch to them to like <laughs> get them to trust. I'm not going to like sell them out on the, on the, on the podcast yeah. because the podcast is different um, energetically than how I was on rock of love. You know, this is, I, I don't do like gotcha style questioning and stuff like that. I'm not doing this to like humiliate anybody or embarrass anybody, right. but um, I need to gain their trust and, and in order to get them to open it up, because the viewers are not going to um, get to see the real Dallas or the real whoever I have on if they're guarded and they're afraid I'm going to like try to pull some shit on them. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, I totally would. I, I haven't reached out yet, but I'm going to, but I have to like do it strategically. So she knows I'm not going to like roast her on, <laughs> on the podcast. Do you think that she even holds anything against you all these years later? Yes. <laughs> I absolutely 100% oh do. God, There's it. probably a Lacey pinata, some like redheaded pinata that she probably beats <laughs> daily. I'm sure there's like voodoo dolls in her house. Um, yeah, she really doesn't like me at all. And the reason I know that is because um, at the end of charm, or sorry, in the middle of charm school, when after she got expelled, she was like, usually when the girls get expelled, we get put off into some room where we never see those girls ever again, <laughs> essentially. That sounds very morbid, but, um, but uh, they hide the girls from us so there can't be any other like interactions. It just wouldn't make sense to the story if there was. So Brandy C and I were out by the pool one day on Charm School and Dallas had just been expelled. And I guess they were doing like her post-show interviews and they left Dallas alone for a few minutes, which it, it was weird for them to do. Um, she must have heard me and Brandy C talking because all of a sudden she came out like after she was expelled and that was really unusual and the cameras didn't catch that. Like nobody was around. Otherwise they would have separated us. And, and Brandy C and I were just like looking at her like, is, Dal is that Dallas? What's she doing? You know? And Dallas, she said something to me and I can't remember what exactly she said, but it was something along the lines of like, Lacey, if I fucking see you outside the show, you better fucking watch it or something like that. Oh like God. to let me know that she wants to murder me basically. <laughs> oh my so, gosh. So I, I get it. Um, so that would be like just another good reason to have her on the podcast. So maybe we can like hash that all out for you guys to see, you know, so we'll see. Wish me luck. <laughs> that would be fun. I would sign, I would pay to watch that. That would be a very fun dynamic to see. Even if there's like, just like some mending that we can see happen, that would, or even just like looking at, you know, I think we all have those moments over the years, or maybe we have a disagreement with somebody and then we, um, you know, we look back at it and we're like, that was not anything like it wasn't as bad or serious or as deep as we thought that it ever was back then. Yeah. You know, and here's the thing I want people to know. I don't hate Dallas and I never really did to be honest with you. Um, I was able to use Dallas as my rival on the show because yeah. she made these disparaging remarks about my animal rights beliefs and that sort of thing. And so 
whether she meant it or not, I don't know, but I was, you know, she, she picked a, a topic that she knew was something I personally cared about, but it also, unbeknownst to her, it gave me the opportunity to, again, be my villain character and kind of use her as the target. And one, there's a big difference between, I'm going to compare for a minute, Dallas and Brandy M. Brandy M, had, I, who I really like, had a really great way of, of dealing with me. And that was, she just flat out refused to engage. engage. And so like, I have an analogy for that. It basically like, if I want to play tug of war with you because I want to yank the rope so hard that you fall on your face in the mud and I've got one end of the rope and I'm giving you the other end of the rope. I'm like, here, come on, come on, let's do tug of war. Come on. Dallas yeah. would take the other end of the rope for me to pull her face down into the mud. Brandy M would go, you know what, Lacey, fuck you and fuck your rope. I'm not playing. And she'd walk off and I'd be like, yeah. no, no, come play. <laughs> you know. And so Brandy M was smart in that regard where she just like wouldn't take the bait. And as evident by, I never had any kind of spats or altercations with Brandy M on either of the shows I was on with her. And um, Dallas, on the other hand, she just like constantly took the bait. I don't know why she did but she did, and it just made it so much fun, <laughs> you oh, know. Well, it was know. fun to watch, for sure. <laughs> um, last question to close out the show is, do you think that there will be any foreseeable mending between you and Heather? Is that something you're even interested in at this point because you have such a long history with her? Um, you know, I would have up until a certain point. Um, Heather crossed a line that I don't think I can come back from personally. And the line that she crossed that I'm referring to is she dragged my husband and my family into the fight. She made um, attempts to publicly embarrass my husband, to publicly, publicly embarrass my family, shame them. She like photoshopped some you know, messages together and posted those. And my husband was so good to Heather when she was here. He made sure he washed and dried her sheets on her bed, washed and dried her towels. He took care of her dog on countless occasions, fed her dog when she wasn't here, you know, provided her with food and toiletries for her bathroom. And he really made sure that she was comfortable while she stayed with us for a few months. He was super nice to her um, whenever she had like boy problems and wanted his advice. He was always there for her. And he was just, my husband is really a sweet, gentle type of person. And he did not deserve that. And I'm very protective of him. I'm protective of everybody that I love. I'm, I, that's my nature. And yeah. so when, you know, to go after someone's family because you're mad at them is like totally some like mafia shit and yeah. it's just not okay with me. So had she just, even if she put me on blast over some bullshit or made up lies about me or whatever, I could have, I could have forgiven that. But the second that you start going after my husband, you go after my family. Um, I, I can't anymore. That's, that's, crossing the line. So because she did that, I don't think, unfortunately, this is anything that um, I can come back from because now I realize that's her go-to. So if I were to bring her back into my life again, I know that the next time she decides to go off the deep end, that's where she'll go. I don't trust her now that she will not involve my family again. So I'm, I'm not going to risk that. It's just not, it's not safe. Her energy is very, very, very toxic. It's very volatile. And I, I can't bring that into my life again. You know, um, it's really, really sad because I like Heather. She is so much fun. She is so charismatic. She's great. Um, in any kind of like entertainment field that she's in, but she's so volatile and it is, it's going to be the the downfall of her entire existence. And it's really sad. It's heartbreaking to see. It's so self-destructive. Yeah. She thinks she's, she's getting back at me or getting back at 12 pack or getting back at Megan or Farah or Ashley or all these people. She's like trying to like get back at, but what it's ultimately doing is, is just hurting her and it's not hurting the rest of us, you know? Yeah. So I, I'm sad about it. I, I'm still, I'm still heartbroken about it. I'm still in shock about it. But that said, I still wish her, well, I hope that she can come to terms with all of her demons and, and get better and have success in her life. Absolutely. Lacey, it was so good to chat with you and to get so much behind the scenes tea on all of these shows that I loved watching. I know everyone is like, I love listening to all the interviews you're doing lately because like we all grew up and loved watching all of these shows on VH1 that when they came to a halt, it was like so sad. It was like the day the music died for all of us. 
And now yeah. the music, the, yeah. now the music is coming back. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me on. And I love your podcast. I think I'm so glad I discovered you. You are such a good host and such a good interviewer. I love the guests that you bring on. Uh-huh. I love the questions that you ask. You are killing it. And I'm, I'm really grateful I got to be a part of your show. So, so thank you. And I wish you all the best. And let's definitely stay in touch. You're a good, you're a good dude. <laughs> Let's do it. Where can people listen to Talk of Love? Um, is it just on YouTube or where can, where can they listen and where can they follow you in the show? Um, basically, if you just Google Talk of Love with Lacey Skulls, it'll all show up. Um, we have a, I have a YouTube channel, talkoflove.com, sorry, youtube.com slash talkoflove. I also have a website, which is talkoflove.net, where I've got all kinds of fun t-shirts for sale. Don't threaten me with a good time, A-list celebrity, a bunch of other really good ones. Um, I'm on Instagram, which is at Talk of Love Podcast, or you can find me personally at Lacey Skulls, um, S-C-U-L-L-S. Um, so I'm on Twitter sometimes. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with it all. But basically, if you just Google Talk of Love with Lazy Skulls, you'll find me. But YouTube is, is the main place to go. Oh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff too. I love it. Everyone needs to go and listen to Talk of Love. I I mean, the episodes are good. The interviews are good. You've had Megan on. You've had um, you had Farrah on most recently. You have a bunch Big of John. Big John. You have a bunch of guests coming up. I can't wait to listen to more of it. Thank you again, Lacey. You guys, you can follow me at Just Plain Zach over on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all over the place, even on TikTok. I'm doing some really bad dance videos on TikTok, but <laughs> they're for your enjoyment. So please go and enjoy. Don't forget to listen to Hashtag No Filter with Zach Peter every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday while we're in quarantine. We're on Fridays on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora. We're basically everywhere podcasts are available, and you will now be able to watch full episodes episodes on Patreon very soon. So get ready. Thank you again, Lacey. I really appreciate chatting with you. You have been a blast and I can't wait for everyone again to go and listen and to binge Talk of Love right now. I love it. All right, guys, I'm going to go watch some throwback episodes of Rock of Love right now and I will talk to you guys on Wednesday. Bye.